Thank you for listening to Depictions Media Radio. Accelerator Center. It's my pleasure to MC today's event. I would like to begin by acknowledging with gratitude and respect that the land on which we gather is the territory of the Musqueam, Squamish, and tsleil nations. Foresight is Canada's clean tech accelerator. We bring innovators, industry, investors, government, and academia together to address today's most urgent climate issues and support a global transition to a green economy. We are delighted to be part of this announcement today. BC has an incredible opportunity to see clean tech become a new energy engine for economic growth. As long as we can leverage deliberate, targeted investments combined with strong climate policy. This is part of what makes today's announcement both timely and exciting. It is my pleasure to introduce the first speaker. Please join in me in extending a warm welcome to British Columbia's Premier, John Horgan. Thank you, uh, Jeanette, uh, for that introduction, and thank you for taking on this responsibility this morning. I, too, want to acknowledge the traditional and unceded territory of the Squamish, Musqueam, and tsleil First Nations, and also to thank Susanna Pierce from Shell Canada, Minister Ravi Kalon, uh, Minister of Jobs, Innovation, and Technology, for joining us today, as well as Santa Ono and Minister Carla Qualtro, who will be uh, coming in via Zoom as a reminder of... Uh, COVID-19 still being with us and the opportunity to ensure that everyone can participate in what is a very exciting announcement for the future of climate action, not just here in British Columbia, but indeed across Canada. It has been uh, a very, very devastating beginning to the summer of 2021. We remember vividly the fires of 2017 and 2018. They did not accompany a heat dome that led to the deaths of many British Columbians because our, of, of our inability to better prepare for the climate future that we all need to live in. And we're here today to talk about how we can get all hands on deck, bringing industry, academia, and orders of government together to address the challenge of our time. We need meaningful action, not just today, but every day as we go forward for this generation and future generations to meet the challenges of moving from a future that is less reliant on fossil fuels and more focused on clean, innovative changes to how we do business, not just here in British Columbia and in Canada, but indeed around the world. And that's why we're partnering with industry today and other orders of government to make that happen, to create a new BC Centre for Innovation and Clean Energy. Together, today, we're announcing a, one point, uh, pardon me, a $105 million investment in kickstarting this low innovation future. Together, British Columbia has already become a destination for clean, low carbon technologies and we want to build on that by starting this innovation today. The centre, of course, will have many strengths. We'll act as an accelerator, which, of course, Jeanette is expert at, and incubating new clusters of technology companies that can help meet the challenges of our time. Businesses developing and commercialising and scaling up is a challenge not just in British Columbia and in Canada, but indeed around the world. So by coming together today, as we are, with the Clean Innovation Centre, we can create the future that we all know that we need. That will mean focusing on investments in new companies that are starting green hydrogen, biofuels, renewable natural gas, battery technologies, and all of the innovations we're going to need to meet the challenges of our time. I want to thank uh, Minister Bruce Ralston, who couldn't be with us here today, for his hard work to get us to this first step as we launch the Innovation Centre, which we hope to have open as early as this fall. Bruce's work has been critical to getting us here, and I believe all of us have to take the same level of energy and focus to meet these challenges. If we are going to have the clean future we all know we need, we need to do it together. Industry, governments of all kinds, as well as, of course, citizens. This is an exciting day for our future, and it's an exciting day for, of course, the generations to come. We're already making, as you know, through Clean BC, significant investments getting people out of fossil fuel cars and into electric vehicles, significant expansions of our public transit systems in collaboration with the federal government. We're seeing the Broadway line making its way all the way to UBC. Santa will be happy to hear that. 
as well as, of course, our recent announcement just last week of the Surrey-Langley SkyTrain system, which will help, again, reduce our emissions and get us back on track to meet the objectives that we must meet collectively, not just as British Columbians and Canadians, but as world citizens to meet the challenges of our time. We cannot let this summer the elimination of the community of Lytton go by without taking immediate action, not just today, but every day going forward. Thanks for joining us. I look forward to working with uh, all of the partners as we build a better BC. Thank you, Premier Horgan. I'm delighted now to introduce Honorable Carla Qualtro, Minister of Employment, Workforce Development and Disability Inclusion, who will be joining us by Zoom. Introduction, good morning, everyone. A special welcome and hello to Premier John Horgan, Ms. Susanna Pierce from Shell, of course, Dr. Santa, o Santa Ono from UBC, and my fellow friend in Delta and Minister Ravi Callan, MLA, MLA for Delta North, and Minister of Jobs, Economic Recovery, and Innovation. Um, today, as the Premier said, is an exciting day, and I'm joining you from the traditional territory of the Sawasan and Musqueam First Nations. It said that while climate change is measured globally, its impact are felt locally. And here in BC, we understand and live this reality. BC has recently had record high and extreme temperatures, not just for BC, but for all of Canada, causing hundreds of health-related deaths, as well as everything from intense forest fires to localized flood advisories. The message could not be clearer. Climate change is real. It's happening now and its impacts will only intensify is already taking a terrible human toll and it's having a profound and lasting impact on our communities, our environment and our economy. This means that our governments have to act and that's why we've teamed up with the province of BC and Shell Canada to support the new BC Centre for Innovation and Clean Energy. This centre reflects our government's own vision for investing in new technologies and cleaner fuels that will deliver our low carbon future, a future that creates good jobs dramatically reduces emissions and leaves no one behind. That same building blocks that the same building blocks that will help us achieve our ambitious goal of reducing Canada's 2005 GHG emission levels by up to 45% before this decade is out and ultimately become a net zero nation by 2050. We've backed up our climate commitments with a strengthened climate plan and a new budget this spring that together would add another $32.6 billion in federal investments. This includes funding to help drive breakthroughs in many of the same areas this centre will be pursuing. Everything from carbon capture to clean hydrogen. In fact, our budget provided specific investments to support such innovations, including $1.5 billion for our Clean Fuels Fund, $319 million over seven years to fund R&D. This is how we create a future that our children will inherit with pride and build upon with confidence. By working together at all levels of government and with all potential partners, British Columbia and Shell are perfect examples. We don't need to be told that our province has long been a national leader on clean growth, including the first jurisdiction to put a price on carbon. We know that the only thing that can match our province's spectacular beauty is our shared determination to protect it. And Shell's participation is equally essential, not just because it's been setting the pace for the oil and gas sector for years, or because of its experience with clean technologies, such as its Quest Carbon Capture and Storage Protection Project in Fort Saskatchewan, but because its employees and all of our oil and gas workers across the country will be critical to achieving our climate goals. They are the engineers, the scientists, and the tradespeople who know how to build energy infrastructure. And they are the same people who will build our renewables, the same people who will help develop tomorrow's innovations and new technologies. The world is looking to Canada to lead the way to net zero emissions. That's what we're doing here today, providing leadership. And our government is proud to be contributing up to $35 million to support innovative made in BC clean tech solutions. I wanna congratulate you Premier, especially and our partners at Shell and everyone who helped make this day possible. I wish you great success with this project. Thank you, merci, miigwech. Thank you, Minister Qualtro. Next up, it is my pleasure to join me in welcoming Susanna Pierce, Country Chair Canada and GM Renewables and Energy Solutions Canada with Shell. Thank you, Jeanette, and good day. It's an honour to join you on the traditional ancestral unceded territory of the Musqueam, Squamish and the Tsleil-Waututh. I'm here in good health and good spirit and hope that all of you are as well. 
And thank you, Premier, Minister Callan, Minister Qualtro, for such fantastic remarks. You know, it's heartwarming to hear the commitment to workers and the commitment to livelihoods and the commitment to do something with climate change. I think we've seen the devastating impacts of the pandemic, but we're also seeing the devastating impacts of climate today, which is why bold, urgent action by government, industry such as ourselves, and all of us need to come together committed to do more and to do more in a faster fashion. For Shell, our target is become a net zero uh, business by 2050 in step with society and in step with society is critical. What that means is we will do everything we can to reduce our scope one, two, and three emissions. What does that mean? The emissions that we produce, the emissions that we cause to be produced, but critically, the emissions that the customers produce. And that is where the majority of the emissions come from. So that's a bold commitment that we have, but we cannot do it alone. We know as Shell that our current business plans don't get us there. And that means we need to change. I have personally been a long time proponent of doing more with less carbon. And in my new role as president and country chair of Shell Canada, as well as GM Renewables and Energy Solutions, I am more committed and have the power to do more than I ever have before. And I'm proud to be in an organization like Shell that I can do it with. I'm also proud to be here in BC, living in BC as a resident, and proud that we can do more in this great province. So I'm seized with the opportunity to find great opportunities in new energies and technologies, biofuels, green and blue hydrogen, EV charging, and renewable power, such as solar and wind. There is a vast landscape of opportunities. There's also a critical opportunity to invest in the new technologies to get them to the scale where they can make significant impact. So this is why it's abundantly clear that joint action is needed to, make, to meet the challenge of climate change. And it does mean partnering across the aisle. It means partnering with governments. It means partnering with like businesses, like-minded businesses, including customers, universities, other organizations, as well as indigenous local communities and environmental groups. Now, we must also tackle those emissions that come from the most hard to abate sectors that can't easily be electrified. And that's aviation, that's shipping and road freight. And I know, as a BCer, that BC has all the right conditions to make these collaborations work. We have supportive government policy, growing customer demand for low carbon energy solutions, and a province that sits as Canada's gateway to Asia and to the US Pacific Northwest. It is our hope that the Center for Innovation and Clean Energy will act as a catalyst, accelerating transformative changes within, within the province energy system in targeted areas that support BC government's Clean BC plan. Now, we are pleased to support Clean BC and the commercialization and scale up of clean energy companies across the province and across Canada. And along with strengthening the ecosystem for innovation, this initiative will bring economic, environmental, and societal benefits to the province and beyond by helping to attract new investment and jobs in a more sustainable economy while reducing greenhouse gas emissions. Now, we've seen the power of public and private partnerships before. And just very recently for Shell in Canada, we've made significant investments in waste to low carbon fuels in Quebec and also in Ontario in investing in a unique biofuels opportunity called Forge. And we will continue to do that here in British Columbia. Now more than ever, we need pioneering governments, businesses who are willing to step up and initiate change. I'm grateful for the leadership shown by the governments of Canada and BC and very pleased to join them in founding the center. But we are just the start. We are challenging other like-minded businesses and companies to join us to maximize the diversity and the impact of this center. More than ever, we must work together to help accelerate climate solutions that scale across society. We are looking forward to the many successful enterprises to be launched by the center in the months and years to come. Thank you. Wow, it's so hard for me not to want to applaud and comment on all of these great components of the announcement. So thank you, Susanna. I'd like to introduce our next speaker, the Honorable uh, Ravi Kalan, Minister of Jobs, Economic Recovery and Innovation. Good morning, and uh, thank you, Jeanette. Um, I'm Ravi Kalan, BC's Minister for Jobs, Economic Recovery, and Innovation. And I want to also acknowledge that I am here today on the territories of the Musqueam, Tsleil-Waututh, uh, and the uh, Squamish peoples. Uh, it's great to be here this morning with uh, Premier Horgan, uh, my federal colleague, and my my MP, uh, Carla Quattro, Minister Carla Quattro, and all these uh, distinguished guests. Building a, brighter, a better and cleaner future is something that British Columbians, myself included, hold near and dear. 
working together, we need to find new ways to fight climate change. Today's announcement, the BC Center for Innovation and Clean Energy, is one of the ways that we're working to do that. The center will build on and complement the work we are doing with Clean BC. With collaboration at the forefront, the center will help position British Columbia as a global leader in finding innovative solutions to combat climate change. To help shape our economic recovery, I've been meeting with provincial leaders, indigenous nations, and experts to hear their perspectives and ideas on the way forward for BC. During these sessions, I've heard loud and clear that climate change and building a cleaner economy are top of mind for British Columbians as we move forward with our economic recovery. People want a better future that will last generations. They want a future that will make a difference for their loved ones. And they want long-term, clean growth that is innovative, sustainable, and includes everyone who lives and works in this beautiful province. We know that Clean BC is critical for a better future. We are striving to build an economic plan that reflects the priorities, strengths, and values of people here in British Columbia. As part of this plan, we will be focused on low carbon in investments that will bring multiple economic benefits, including good paying jobs and long term resilience. Through key investments like the BC Centre for Innovation and Clean Energy, we look forward to working together to find solutions that will help us build a stronger BC. So thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Kalan. Uh, we have one final speaker joining us today by Zoom. I have the honor of introducing to you virtually Dr. Santa Ono, President of UBC. Thank you very much for inviting me to join this exciting announcement about British Columbia's Centre for Innovation and Clean Energy. I'd like to first uh, acknowledge that I'm speaking to you from the traditional unceded territory of the Musqueam people. Recent events have shown how climate change is having a dramatic and disproportionate impact on Canada's Indigenous peoples. I want to acknowledge how critical it is that meaningful climate action must take steps to support and amplify the human rights of Indigenous peoples. The climate crisis is a pressing challenge that will require determination, innovation, and collaboration to tackle. I'm excited that the BC Center for Innovation and Clean Energy will exemplify this by bringing together the federal and provincial governments, research institutions like UBC, and industry like Shell. And beyond us here today, there is great potential for this center to expand partnerships across society to work collaboratively to address this defining issue of our time. I know that I and many British Columbians and Canadians who care deeply about the climate are excited to see what the center will achieve and the innovations that it will support. It is yet another example of how British Columbia will lead, not only Canada, but the world. Accelerating action to combat climate change is a priority, not only for the provincial government, but for UBC and for all British Columbians. In 2019, UBC issued a declaration on the climate emergency, affirming our responsibility in actively combating climate change, to effect change beyond our institution, and to advance a sustainable and just society across the province, Canada, and the world. We are following the leadership of you, Premier Horgan. This declaration builds on many years of climate leadership at the university, which includes adopting aggressive GHG emission reduction targets that we are achieving by integrating sustainable practices and technologies across campus infrastructure and operations, all while growing our campus footprint. With a typical daytime population of over 80,000 people, we have transformed UBC's campus into a living lab to trial and showcase city scale technologies and solutions in transportation, housing, energy production, among many others. And UBC researchers are working with partners in British Columbia, Canada, and around the world to produce the discoveries and innovations 
we need to adapt our own behaviors and to restore our planet with notable strengths in hydrogen energy, carbon capture, and reuse, advanced materials for clean energy, biofuels, and bioproducts. And of course, at the core of this work is the development and deployment of the next generation of climate action leaders. Every year, over 11,000 graduates leave UBC to enter the workforce, and increasingly, many are choosing to work in areas directly tied to climate action. Today's center is predicated on active and strategic partnerships. And I pledge to you, and I hope that UBC and all post-secondary institutions across BC will soon be able to launch new collaborations that realize large emission reductions across all economic sectors. Thanks again for inviting me to participate in today's exciting announcement and congratulations on your significant investments in the BC Center for Innovation and Clean Energy. I am proud to be a British Columbian. Thank you very much. Yeah, <laughs> I'm proud to be a British Columbian too. Um, <laughs> thank you, Santa. Uh, it has truly been a pleasure uh, to learn more about this opportunity uh, from today's speakers. I speak on behalf of Foresight when I say that we feel tremendously the same sense of urgency about meeting climate challenges that we're all aware we're facing. Every day we work with innovators who are creating and commercializing solutions, with industry partners who are seeking clean sex, clean tech solutions to evolve their operations and their ability to service their customers, with corporate partners who want to be part of the solution. Foresight is committed to collaborating with the partners across Canada to share ideas and best practices. We are doing what we can to energize innovation. We are excited by this challenge and look forward to continuing to support this initiative and the growth and impact of clean tech in, in British Columbia. Today's announcement regarding the Centre for Innovation and Clean Energy is truly an opportunity to position BC as that leader, as a whole on the global stage of clean tech innovation. I look forward to seeing how the countless entrepreneurs, innovators and SMEs across the province will be able to engage with the Centre and help drive innovations to the challenges ahead. Premier Horgan, uh, I would like to invite you back up to the podium at this time to address any questions and comments. Thank you. <clears throat> Well, thank you, Jeanette, and uh, fellow speakers today. Again, this is the type of collaboration that British Columbians expect from their leaders, whether they be in industry, like Susanna and Shell, whether it be uh, from our post-secondary institutions with uh, uh, great leaders like Dr. Santa Ono. Uh, I was thinking as Dr. Ono was talking about what they're doing at UBC every single day about the first significant uh, mass timber facility, the Brock Commons facility, 18 stories of mass timber construction that has opened up new opportunities and adaptation in the forest sector. And that's just one element that's going on at UBC as we speak. And of course, um, to my colleague, uh, uh, Ravi Kalan, who has uh, taken on uh, with, uh, in fact, inspiration, the challenges of generations to come right now. This is an exciting step forward. Uh, we have much uh, highway to go uh, before we're done, but we're on the right track. We're working together. Federal government, provincial government will be bringing on municipal partners and others, as uh, Susanna said, challenging uh, uh, the corporate sector to step up and participate as they always do to meet the challenges of our time. So it's very exciting. The workforce of today is going to be the workforce of tomorrow. The tools they will be using will be different. The outcomes will be better. I'm excited for British Columbia. I'm excited for Canada. And we need to take this energy to the COP26 conference in Glasgow and talk about how Canada and British Columbia can lead the way. We're already collaborating with Washington State and other sub-national jurisdictions to make sure we have an impact on the world stage to make it abundantly clear that the time for discussion has come to an end and action is required right now. Thank you, Premier. As a reminder to everybody on the phone line, please press star one to enter the queue. You're limited to one question and one follow-up. First question today is from Richard Zussman, Global News. Uh, Premier, when you were asked last month about uh, the border between the U.S. and Canada being reopened, you said you hoped it would wait until September, but expected that it would be open again in August. We've now heard from the Prime Minister that it's expected to be open for U.S. travelers in August. 
Are you still concerned about that and what impact it could have around the spread of COVID-19? Uh, no, uh, I was uh, on a First Minister's conference yesterday with the Prime Minister and my colleagues across the country. Uh, we've been talking about uh, reopening the borders for some time. Of course, we had the very positive announcement by the federal government that the cruise ship season in 2022 can start planning right now. That was an important step forward. That happened yesterday. Uh, then we had the, the Premier's gathering to talk about uh, the solutions that we need to see uh, at our borders. Uh, I did... Uh, uh, remind the Prime Minister that this is going to be a massive undertaking. Uh, the province stands ready to assist. We have not just uh, land borders and air uh, access points, but we also have a marine coastal border, and we're going to take as much energy as we can to put towards making sure we keep British Columbians safe. But I'm confident 80% uh, uh, first doses in British Columbia, just heading towards 50% second doses. British Columbians get the importance of vaccines. We're on the right track. Other parts of Canada are on on the right track and the Prime Minister made a commitment that uh, two doses of a World Health Organization approved vaccine is going to be required to enter uh, Canada and I think that's the sort, type of assurance that we wanted to hear and I look forward to working with them to open our borders uh, in August to, to American citizens and uh, later in that month or early September uh, for international travelers. Richard, do you have a follow-up? Yes, yeah, so there's a group of mayors and officials uh, in and around Kamloops who have uh, voted unanimously uh, for the province to call a provincial state of emergency when it comes to fires. The D.C. Liberals have been asking for you to call a provincial state of emergency when it comes to fires. Why will you not call a provincial state of emergency? And is the fact that a state of emergency could have an impact on the tourism sector, is that one of the reasons why you're holding back? Well, uh, first of all, you're... you're first question uh, was about borders opening in August and September. So the tourism industry is not top of mind today. The fire season is. In 2003, uh, when there was a state of emergency declared because of fires by the former government, it was done on the advice of Emergency Management BC and the Wildfire Service, not the official opposition or not anyone else in the community, but the professionals that we put in place to protect British Columbia. In 2017, it was Todd Stone from Kamloops, uh, who was the minister at the time, declared a state of emergency, not because the opposition called for it, but because he got advice from the Wildfire Service and Emergency Management BC that that was the time to act. And similarly, in 2018, we followed suit. Uh, I'm absolutely prepared to call a state of emergency when it is required by those professionals that are putting their lives on the line to protect families, property, and British Columbia. I appreciate the enthusiasm of the official opposition, but again, uh, I think most British Columbians would prefer that I listen to the people that know what they're doing, and that's exactly what we intend to do. There is not one advantage at all from calling a state of emergency except to bring more people together. I think we've had unprecedented cooperation since 2017 at the municipal level from industry. We have states of emergency, local states of emergency, where fires are persistent, and I believe that's the best way forward. I'm going to lean on the professionals and thank the partisans for their efforts. Next question is from Lisa Cordasco, Vancouver Sun. Thank you. Good morning, Tony. I'd like to follow up on that question. Now, yesterday, the BC Wildfire Service said it has to pick and choose which fire it, it will fight. And given the fact that a state of emergency would allow the use of private sector equipment and personnel to be seconded, why not do it? Well, again, uh, when the, the professionals ask for it, we'll do it. They haven't yet. Uh, who have called for this are uh, BC Liberals, and I, I'm grateful for their enthusiasm, but I, I'm going to lean on the people that know what they're doing. And when we need that, we'll call for it. We already have full participation from the federal government, some 500 military personnel as well as equipment. We're working with the private sector in areas of concern where fires are, are underway. 300 plus fires in British Columbia to this point, 27 over the past uh, number of days. We have significant challenges. We have the resources to manage that to the best of our ability and if there was a state of emergency called today it would have no impact on resources because they're already in place. We have been working with provinces across the country. Quebec, New Brunswick have offered resources. In fact they're on the ground. We have uh, Mexican uh, firefighters who are in transit should be here in the next number of days. We're putting all hands on deck. The state of emergency is not required to do that. Follow up Lisa. Yes, I'd like to ask the Federal Minister, and if you could respond, um, in research by the NT 
Teaching and Missions Lab at Carleton University, has found that uh, BC oil and gas facilities are producing up to 2.2 2. 2 times more methane pollution that um, is currently being captured by traditional methods. Now, they're saying that this puts the whole question of achieving climate targets into question and um, that we won't meet them. What, what is your response to that report in this time? Not sure that Carla could hear that question. I barely could. Uh, Carla, are you in a position to answer that? I think I got it. Thank you, Premier. Um, I, I think that only highlights the really important. Um, you know, any investment in lowering emissions is a step in the right direction, and we are investing in these clean energy projects to get at. Um, you know, to get to our emission targets, both provincially and federally, and it's exactly this kind of partnerships that are going to get us there. And I apologize if I missed part of the question. I was trying to listen. Next I, hope, I hope that meets, uh, meets your needs, Lisa. Next question is from Lisa Houston. It's 11.30. Hi there, Premier. Uh, I'm going back to the borders for a second. I'm wondering if what it might look like if there was any discussion about you know, right now people have to take, have to show up with a negative PCR test and then take another one at the border. What are some of the things that we might look at when Americans first can cross starting what looks like it might be a month from now? Yeah, good question. Uh, many of those uh, details were sought yesterday from my colleagues across the country. Uh, the federal government, the prime minister, and uh, uh, the minister of intergovernmental relations were very attentive uh, to uh, suggestions and proposals from various provinces. Obviously, uh, the large provinces like Quebec, Ontario, BC, and Alberta, who have uh, large populations and lots of uh, traffic at airports and at our border crossings, uh, our land borders, uh, are concerned that there's capacity at at border control to meet the objectives. Uh, I know people trying to travel now are required to get private sector testing done and the costs are prohibitive. Obviously uh, the, uh, the health authorities in British Columbia are testing people with symptoms, uh, not testing people so that they can travel. Uh, that may change uh, in the, t uh, the weeks ahead as we see continued decline in cases and, and those presenting with symptoms because of the high vaccination rates. But the details will be clearer as we get closer to the dates, but the Prime Minister was very much seized of concerns across the country about making sure that border services had the resources that they need. You'll remember when the borders were closed, uh, we asked uh, and, and offered, uh, rather, and, and just uh, delivered uh, provincial government employees at border points to help uh, the federal government do their work and it's that type of collaboration I think that uh, the Prime Minister is welcoming. Uh, I certainly am prepared to uh, offer and, and I believe the major provinces are as well. I think it's the collaboration that got us to this point as a country. Uh, I believe it's the 21st of uh, July. Uh, there was some concern that that was uh, too fast. That was certainly the view of British Columbia and, and others. Uh, there, were, there were provinces that felt that we were ready to go now. Uh, I want to make sure that uh, we are right beside the federal government on these matters, support and making sure that if we need to be nimble, as you suggest, we will be. And I've, I've got no indication at all that the federal government will not continue to be responsive and attentive and collaborative with the provinces on these important issues. Uh, we, we have uh, significant concerns about being ready. Uh, I've expressed that to the Prime Minister and I have every confidence that he's going to meet those objectives. Next question is from Rob Buffum, CTD, CTV Victoria. Oh, hi, good morning. Um, Premier, I'm wondering your thoughts on, you know, we're hearing about cases increasing in places like California where there's now a mandatory indoor mask policy. What are your concerns? I know we're doing well in terms of vaccinations, but people who are fully vaccinated can still get and pass on the, you know, COVID. Are you worried about Americans coming here in light of what's happening south of the border? Uh, again, we've got a month ahead of us, so five weeks uh, to uh, the date that the federal government has set. Uh, I believe we'll be monitoring closely. Uh, Dr. Henry and her team and the BC Center for Disease Control have done extraordinary work over the past 16 months. I have every expectation they're going to continue to monitor and advise governments on uh, best, the best way forward, and we're going to take that advice. It served us all as citizens very, very well, and I'm not going to deviate from that. Uh, but Dr. Henry is uh, comfortable. Uh, she is part of the uh, the national initiative here, of course, working with Dr. Tam and other public health officers, giving advice to the federal government, and then, of course, separately to all of the provinces. So I'm confident that the science is, is ruling the day right now. And if we see evidence that we need to shift, we'll shift. Follow up, Rob. 
Yeah, I'm just wondering if you can expand. You, you mentioned earlier that um, it came up yesterday, the idea of opening the border to American citizens as soon as next week, but you'd indicated you weren't in support of that. Uh, well, at the same time, other provinces wanted it to open immediately. Can you kind of flesh out for us which provinces were interested in seeing the border open immediately and why you didn't agree? I, I can speak for British Columbia. Uh, we, we said that we felt that the uh, August uh, date that the federal government was working on met our needs. Uh, others had a different point of view. Uh, you'll have to ask them. Uh, it, was, uh, it wasn't a confidential meeting, but I, I don't feel comfortable speaking for others. There was at least one province that felt that uh, urgency was a better course of action. I disagree with that. Uh, the majority certainly disagreed with that. And I think, again, uh, I, I think of Canada, as most people should, as this great experiment that is always uh, under review. And uh, we come together, we grapple, we disagree, and we move forward uh, together. And, and that's, that's what we're doing now on this, is on this issue. Derek Penner, Vancouver Sun. I was wondering, um, DIF will support um, emissions sort of reducing activities, but how, how does the activities from this offset the fact that um, British Columbia's own natural gas production and emissions from that have been increasing? They've increased substantially and are, 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 are rising. Well, again, uh, we have to change how we behave, and that means making sure that we have energy systems in place to meet the needs of people, industry, and our province and our country, and we need to do it in a way that's radically different from the past. And that's why we're grateful to have a partner uh, at the beginning of this initiative, like Shell, who have a big role to play in British Columbia and are committed, uh, among uh, all of the, the large uh, companies, committed to net zero uh, by 2050. Uh, they're working on carbon capture. They're working on a whole range of initiatives. And to bring their experience to bear is critically important. We need everybody. We need non-governmental organizations. We need uh, post-secondary institutions. We need governments. We need industry. And we need workers all pulling together. Uh, we can certainly look at our past and say it was insufficient. But we need to now focus on our future and how can we collaborate, work together to drive down those emissions. That's the objective. And uh, perfection is the enemy of progress. We're underway. We're launching. This organization will grow. It will allow, as Jeanette has said, uh, incubation and acceleration of small, medium-sized businesses that will unlock the challenges we have ahead of us. If we had the solutions today, we'd be working on them immediately. This center will allow that innovation to take place in a collaborative way with industry, government, and uh, academia to meet the objectives of the future. Uh, this is a, a bold step forward, and I'm very excited about it. That uh, does not to relieve of us of our, of our our obligation of the past, but I think it sets us on a course for the future that will meet the needs of generations to come, and that's our obligation today. Derek, do you have a follow-up? Um, yeah. Um, earlier this week, the European Union unveiled um, a very ambitious um, uh, sort of statement on targets for emissions reductions that um, make other countries and, and, and jurisdictions look, look less ambitious. How much pressure does that put on British Columbia to um, look at and perhaps revise what it's doing with Clean BC? Well, certainly uh, Clean BC is continent leading, uh, and if we were going to r remain continent leading, we need to adapt and change as new evidence and new information becomes available. Uh, that's certainly the task that Minister Heyman has been given, uh, and I believe that he's discharging that very effectively, collaborating with Minister Ralston, Minister Callon. This is an across-government approach by us. George uh, Heyman is focused on the Clean BC components, and we will amend targets, we will amend our objectives, bringing in smart regulations to meet our needs as required. But uh, there will be changes in Clean BC, to be sure. There will be changes in our approach, to be sure, because we have to do that. That's what the EU has signaled with their changes. That's what Shell, quite frankly, is signaling by being a key part of what's happening in the EU. Next question is from Alexandra Sagan, The Logic. Hi, uh, and just wondering if you can tell us a little bit more about the center itself. Where will it be located? Where are you in that process? And is the physical location part of what will open in the fall of 2021? 
Uh, we haven't yet uh, landed on a location. Certainly, Dr. Ono is uh, uh, UBC would be uh, one location. Simon Fraser, uh, particularly the Surrey campus, which is developing and growing, where there's more space, uh, would be a, another possible location. Uh, we're going to work on those issues with uh, the board members as the board grows uh, to meet uh, to meet the needs of the of the center. But uh, today, we wanted to launch. Over the next number of weeks and months, we'll be working on where we're going to be, who the board will, and how many other partners we have. I don't know if Mr. Callan, you want to add a little bit to that? Or does that cover it? So we'll have more to say in the fall. We haven't landed uh, anywhere yet, but uh, I know uh, Dr. Ono was always happy to uh, invite the world to come to uh, UBC and participate in uh, groundbreaking uh, uh, research, and then, of course, commercializing that research to meet the needs of community. Do you have a follow-up, Alexandra? Yeah, so um, in its remarks, Trail Canada said that they're, you know, challenging industry to participate as well. And I'm wondering if you're looking for financial commitments, more financial commitments from other industry partners, where you are in that process, and is that where ongoing funding will come from? Uh, you, yes and yes. Uh, we are looking to expand uh, the corporate participation to be sure. Uh, as I said, uh, we wanted to launch. Uh, the federal government uh, in their budget 2021 put the resources in place, the $35 million. The $35 million that, uh, that we have earmarked came from our Stronger BC plan, uh, which uh, Minister Callan was key in, in developing. And then again, of course, it was part of our budget as well. So with Shell participating with the $35 million contribution, that puts a lot of uh, uh, capital in play, a uh, lot of opportunity to get going, and again, the call for uh, other corporate pr participants I'm grateful for, and perhaps, Susanna, you want to add to that? Yes, thank you for the question. I think it is absolutely critical, as I said in my remarks, that we come together across industry, government, and other stakeholders to create the scale for these opportunities and technologies to make really significant carbon uh, reductions. And it does relate to the infrastructure that each of us have. And so the more industry participants, the more different points of view, but also the more capital that we can really deploy in a dedicated fashion to make these technologies grow to scale, but to have the most significant impact. So indeed, we are looking for other industry partners, and we are this, just the first. We're just the first member of this, and indeed, looking for more. Next question is from Willie, William Burr, CBC Radio Canada. Um, I was actually just wondering, first of all, would Minister Quattro, are you um, able to offer an answer in French? By any chance, I'm just wondering. It's okay if not. Absolutely. Sorry? Absolument. Am I off, guys? Okay, super. Oui, je vous entends. Merci. Um, Est-ce que vous pouvez juste me dire euh, vraiment la, la signification de ce nouveau centre, euh, um, super? Absolument. Alors, avec l'investissement du gouvernement de la, de la Colombie-Britannique, avec Shell, avec le gouvernement du Canada, ça fait 105 millions de dollars dans le projet vert et um, clean, excuse-moi, mais uh, on va essayer ensemble de collaborer pour trouver des solutions des très grands problèmes de, du climat, du changement du climat que nous devons faire face à. On doit simplement regarder notre province avec les feux de forêt et, et tous les autres problèmes climatiques et on sait que cette sorte de collaboration, ça, ça marche et on va agrandir l'argent avec les autres partenaires, mais aujourd'hui, on commence à travailler ensemble d'une façon un peu plus différente qu'auparavant. Tu vas faire la pointe? Um, yes. um, je voulais savoir, et peut-être que um, le Premier ministre pourrait mieux répondre, mais combien de personnes travailleront là-bas um, et est-ce qu'il y a des, des attentes de, de, de résultats uh, dans la première année? Est-ce qu'il est qu y a des, des, um, des échéanciers? Um, Premier, he's asking how many people will be working on this in the first year and other outcomes um, are, are, are kind of deliverables within the first year of operation of the centre. Uh, je peux absolument faire la traduction, mais je ne sais pas la réponse. <laughs> Well, uh, I can uh, offer up, uh, we, uh, we hope to be uh, fully underway uh, this fall. Again, Minister Ralston, Minister Callan will be working with industry partners and others, uh, populating the board. It's a not-for-profit that will be looking independently at proposals that come forward and then funding those proposals. The objective is, as, as uh, Susanna Pierce said, collaboration to find solutions to the challenges of our time. That does not 
uh, lend itself to measurement at the beginning, but certainly the outcomes will be evident as we amend, uh, as one of the questioners asked today, uh, the initiatives within Clean BC, the regulatory regime uh, where businesses will operate, and how we use, as Susanna said, the infrastructure that's in place, transitioning it to a cleaner infrastructure to meet the challenges ahead. We have massive, massive issues to deal with, and the only way we're going to find solutions is if we're all in it together. Today is a step forward for British Columbia and Canada to say to industry, to say to not-for-profits, to say to uh, post-secondary institutions, we're ready to go, are you? And they are, and, and now we can start to do the incubation, and Jeanette has a vast experience in this regard. It's giving resources, helping collaborate small businesses that lead to medium-sized businesses, and then ultimately large businesses. The employment opportunities here are immense. Uh, the transition from where we are to where we need to get to will be labor-intensive. It will be driven by innovation, driven by people, and we're pretty excited about that. Measuring it today is impossible, but doing it today is essential. We have time for one more question this morning. Alyssa Thibault, CTV, Vancouver. Oh, hi, Premier. I uh, just want to go back to uh, to the wildfire situation. Uh, this is a question for my colleague. Um, the, the BC Fire Service says there's just too many fires and they can't get to all of them right now. Uh, what kind of support are you looking from across Canada and potentially internationally under our, some of our mutual aid agreements? Well, we have, as I said, uh, Quebec and New Brunswick have already uh, uh, sent resources. Mexico has sent, uh, resources are on the way. Uh, we have uh, normally uh, relied uh, heavily on Australia because of the inverted seasons. They're uh, going into their winter as we are heading into our summer. But there are significant COVID issues uh, within Australia, and that we're not they're not prepared to join us at this time. Again, we also work with California, Washington, and Oregon. Uh, we've had uh, BC Fire fighters going south uh, every year since I've been Premier, uh, and we, we have not yet seen a, a significant number coming north, and that's a result of the fact that, of course, we're in the same heat dome. We're having the same challenges in, the, in our time zone, which is still uh, flipping back in the fall currently, but uh, that's another issue. But, uh, you know, I, I, uh, I'm confident, uh, based on briefings from uh, the fire service, which I get uh, daily and had this morning, that we have the resources in place to do what we can, but uh, more resources are not going to help uh, uh, unless we have all hands on deck uh, at the community level, and that's happening. Uh, again, I go back to the notion of the need for a, an emergency declaration. In the past, that has been required to ensure that we can harness the resources that we need. But people are stepping up. They're not, they're not resisting, whether it be industry or community. Uh, indigenous communities, of course, we have uh, uh, unique relationships there, and the federal government has a key role to play. The Prime Minister was here uh, a week ago, and, uh, and we, we uh, government officials uh, from the province and the federal government met with uh, uh, nations in, in and around Lytton to plot the way forward for the rebuild and the, and the adaptation. And this, again, is another example of how we all need to collaborate to rebuild Lytton so that it is fire smart, first and foremost, but it is also a community of the future with clean buildings, uh, net zero buildings, and, a, and a, a way forward that will not only bring people back to Lytton, but bring more people to Lytton as they get excited about communities for the future and the type of things we're talking about today with the Clean Innovation Centre. Alyssa, do you have a follow-up? No, that's fine. Thank you. So that's all the time we have for today. Thank you for joining us. Thanks, Jeanette. Thanks. Thank you for listening today, and thank you for supporting us with our sponsors. Please go to depictions.media for more information, and click on our contact link and let us know how we can help, how we can help bring your story and help bring us to a better world. This show has been produced by Depictions Media. Please contact us at depictions.media for more information.